Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we're here to talk about the readings for the memorial of St. Maximilian Kolbe, which falls on the Friday of the 19th week of Ordinary Time this year. And oh my goodness, do we have some heavy readings for today, some pretty intense stuff going on, okay? Uh, so let's jump right in. And the theme for today's readings are going to be marital fidelity. And in our first reading, we have a, a really kind of edgy passage from Ezekiel uh, chapter 16 that uses some strong imagery uh, related to marriage and marital infidelity to talk about the relationship of the people of Israel with their God. Um, now, uh, Ezekiel is, really pushes the envelope in terms of his imagery that he employs in his book. And, uh, you know, take this the right way, but it was frankly considered to be sort of an R-rated book among biblical books by the ancient rabbis. And they even placed some restrictions on how old you had to be before you were allowed to read the book of Ezekiel. And, and uh, for certain passages, you had to have somebody else in the room when you read it, etc. And, uh, you know... Ezekiel chapter 16 is an example of one of these passages that caused the ancient rabbis to put Ezekiel into kind of a special and semi-restricted category in terms of who could study uh, this book in ancient times. But I'm just going to generally, generally summarize uh, the gist of this uh, passage that we have in our first reading. And essentially... Uh, what, is, what Ezekiel does is he describes Eze uh, the people of Israel um, as if they were a girl who grew up in uh, poverty, but then when she reached the age of marriage, found a patron in the person of God who comes and lifts her out of poverty and distress and... Um, uh, washes her and clothes her in lavish fashion and provides for her in a very beautiful way and then marries her. Um, but then woman Israel is not faithful to the Lord and goes after different lovers which represent different pagan nations that the people of Israel allied themselves with when they should have just uh, relied upon the Lord for protection and for sustenance. And so Israel becomes metaphorically a harlot running after foreign gods and foreign alliances and treaties when she should have been faithful to the Lord God. And the passage concludes uh, with God speaking and saying, Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you when you were a girl, and I will set up an everlasting covenant with you that you may remember and be covered with confusion and that you may be utterly silenced for shame when I pardon you for all that you have done, says the Lord God. So the final word from the Lord in this whole situation is that despite the fact that Israel has not been faithful to the marital covenant that they have with the Lord God, God will always be faithful to that nuptial or marital covenant that he has with his people, and he will never break that. And that's a very important concept. Um, God is love, but if you do the word studies and find out what kind of love God is, God is a love that the ancient people of Israel described with the word hesed, which means the, the love that spouses have for one another or that covenant partners have for one another. It is a love characterized by uh, everlasting fidelity. So God's love for us is the love of a faithful husband or a faithful spouse. It's not simply eroticism, although there is that attraction or that passion, passionate element, just as there is that passionate element in the love between uh, spouses. But it's not reduced to that, nor is it merely affection or brotherly love, it's this kind of spousal covenantal love. That is what we mean when we say God is love. And this is very important now when we go to our gospel reading, 
where our Lord is challenged by the Pharisees on the issue of divorce. So some Pharisees approach Jesus, testing him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause, whatever? We know from the ancient Mishnah, which is a collection of rabbinic lore compiled around the year 200, that during the time of our Lord in the first century, there was a lively debate among the Pharisees over the proper grounds for divorce. You had the more restricted school of Shammai among the Pharisees that said, that divorce is only permissible in a very narrow range of categories, only if one's wife had been unfaithful to her husband. Then you had the more permissive school of Hillel that said, uh, no, um, uh, you know, any kind of offense, uh, you know, even like uh, burning one's dinner or something like that could be the cause of divorcing one's wife. And then you had Rabbi Akiva, who was extremely liberal, and said, oh, if you just see a, a prettier woman, you can, you can divorce your wife and go after that other woman. So you see that there was a, a wide range among the Pharisaic rabbis over what they considered proper grounds for the divorce. So they come to Jesus to get his opinion. Jesus takes the same position that the Essenes took. If you've ever heard my uh, um, work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, we go, I go into this quite a bit in my various books and talks on this issue. But uh, like the Essenes, what our Lord does is go back to the beginning before human sin. And, and our Lord builds his theology of marriage from the way things were in creation prior to Genesis 3 and prior to falling into temptation. So our Lord says, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, man must not separate. Wow, this is very fascinating and profound. What you, you might wonder to yourself, where does Jesus get this idea that God has joined the husband and wife together? Our Lord authoritatively interprets the end of Genesis 2 as what is called a divine passive. In certain places in the Bible, in order to avoid using directly the holy name of God, Different sacred authors would simply use the passive voice. Um, you know, you know what the passive voice is. You know, rather than saying Joe did whatever, you just say whatever was done, right? And 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 don't mention Joe. Well, again, in order to avoid using the holy name of God, which is treated very um, sacredly by the ancient uh, Israelites, they would sometimes phrase things in the passive voice but it was known that God was the agent of the action. And so our Lord uh, interprets the end of Genesis 2 as a divine passive. And so when it says, the two shall become one flesh, Jesus interprets that to mean, by God's action, they shall become one flesh. And this is a common way of understanding um, scriptural passages for the ancient Israelites. And our Lord has the authority to interpret this um, in a binding way, and that's exactly what he does. So what God has joined together, man must not separate, or Lord, understanding that when a spouse is married, it's God establishing that union. They then said to them, why then did Moses command that a man give a woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? He said, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. This is very interesting. Our Lord is a very good and a very good rabbi, a very good interpreter of the law. And our Lord recognizes that within the law, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, there is a hierarchy of authority there. And the laws and principles that are related in Genesis 1 and 2 have the highest authority because they are given by God before there is any human sin. And after human sin, some of the laws that are given, even by God himself, are accommodations to human sin, but don't represent God's highest and best intentions for the human race. And our Lord uh, establishes the theology of matrimony based on the highest intentions of God's will expressed in the first chapters before sin had tainted 
uh, the world. And so he goes back to the beginning. As I mentioned, the Essenes at Qumran that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls, they did the exact same thing. They appealed to the Yasoth Habariah, that means the principle of creation, when they developed their theology of matrimony as well. And likewise, they did not allow divorce either. Or I should say, they did not allow divorce and remarriage, which is importantly different. They did permit separation under certain, certain uh, situations, but you could not remarry because you were married for life. It was very Catholic. Anyway, from the beginning it was not so. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful and marries another, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if that is the case of a man and wife, it is better not to marry. Ho, oh, go apostles. These are the fountainhead of our uh, holy orders here. How inspiring. Okay. I always have to chuckle when I get here uh, because the, the apostles themselves uh, almost wilt at this teaching of our Lord. They, they, like, Lord, it, this just seems impossible that we hold people to the standard of remaining faithful for life, but our Lord does not relent. And it has been difficult for the church throughout the centuries, and even persons in holy orders who have succeeded from the apostles have sometimes wilted in the face of opposition to our Lord's full teaching on marriage. And some, you know, bishops and, and others sometimes have failed to hold the line on this and uh, uphold our Lord's teachings. Others, though, have, have indeed, and some have been martyred uh, for this. We think of St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More, who uh, ended up essentially being martyred for uh, staying faithful to the church's teaching on matrimony, among other things, in the case of Henry VIII's divorce. Um, but, uh, but we see that from the beginning, this has been a hard teaching. Even the apostles themselves consider this to be a hard teaching. Um, so um, on the issue of it being better not to marry, our Lord says that not everyone can accept that truth, it being better not to marry, but only those to whom it's granted. He's speaking about celibacy here now. And then he begins uh, to talk about uh, celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven and says whoever can accept that ought to. This is our Lord commending the lifestyle of celibacy, which we see in the religious life, um, in the priesthood, and also in uh, other forms of life. I mean, there are, there are non-consecrated people within the church who uh, willingly take on a celibate lifestyle. Um, some of them are associated with apostolic movements like uh, the prelature of Opus Dei, and others uh, simply accept this as a personal calling and without ever uh, taking religious vows, uh, nonetheless embrace a celibate life because it frees them to uh, work more effectively for God's kingdom uh, in their personal vocations. But for today, I want to focus on our Lord's teaching on marriage. Uh, let us understand that um, lifelong marital fidelity has always been seen and understood as challenging from the very beginning. Nonetheless, it is the teaching of the God-man, Jesus Christ, based on the revelation um, given by his divine Father in the scriptures um, and based on God's own nature, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the very nature of the triune God is the love of fidelity that the ancient Israelites termed chesed. Just as we saw that God would never divorce his people in the first reading, so we are called to imitate God and be like God and be divine in our actions by always being faithful to our spouse for our entire lives. Even when our spouses may be unfaithful to us, we are called to imitate God and be faithful to them. That is uh, the teaching of Christ. I know it is difficult, but we can call on the grace of the Holy Spirit. Um, St. Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature, 1 Peter 1, 4. That is the meaning of the sacraments. The sacraments infuse that chesed of God into our hearts and give us God's faithful love with which we can love our spouses and others and, main, and, and be faithful to other people for our entire lives, not in our own power, 
but using the power of God, which comes through the Holy Spirit, which we receive ordinarily through uh, the sacraments. That is the message of the Christian life. At today's Mass, let's pray for all married couples. Uh, let's pray for the triumph of Christian teaching on matrimony uh, within our own generation. Uh, let's pray for an end to this culture of divorce that we witness in Western society. And let's pray for a return, beginning with our church and then with the rest of society, to a vision of marriage as a lifelong, faithful, loving union between one man and one woman ordered toward family life and open to that very life and that uh, fertility that leads to children. Let's pray for this. And this has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville on the feast day of St. Maximilian Kolbe, who was faithful to death like the God that he served. And let's ask for his prayer, St. Maximilian Kolbe, pray for us. <laughs>